Vintage Audio Attic Repair and Restoration. Today I want to talk about electrolytic capacitors in vintage audio equipment and whether you should change them or you shouldn't change them or you should change some of them. Um, just uh, generally out there on the internet there's there's all types of different positions and the one thing that I see missing out there you know whether you're for it or against it it's a lot of personal opinion it's my technician said it's in my experience it's it's all these things that that have some validity but in today's world you can go right to the manufacturers websites and they'll tell you all about the design of them the testing and validation of them and the reliability of them you know you don't have to go to some forum and some guy says do it or don't go to the manufacturer and if you google electrolytic capacitor lifespan you'll come up with all the manufacturers and also some of the um, part suppliers that provide links like here I show a link to Illinois capacitor and gives you a little idea of, of what they're going to talk about and you know these are the people that are the experts and here I show um, you know a link from Mauser a big parts house but to Elna they were a big supplier of uh, capacitors in the 60s 70s and 80s for uh, Japanese uh, vintage equipment and they'll tell you everything you wanted to know and even more <laughs> probably more than you wanted to know um, some basic things like this you know I mean that that just these are three pages out of hundreds on just talking about the reliability here's Nishnikon they're on there every series they make is on there here's Illinois capacitor giving you a little brief two page kind of here we condensed it this is kind of like um, electrolytic uh, capacitors for dummies you know they've taken hundreds of pages and and then fortunately somebody wrote it in a way that you could understand it now if you want to keep going go ahead and uh, do a little bit of math figure it out for yourself but I you know suggest that you get a you know maybe a stiff drink when you do that um, you know this is some of the equipment I've worked on in the past um, you know you can obviously tell that something happened with that capacitor not good and here's part of it too that went over all over the back of this Akai uh, reel to reel here's a filter capacitor out of a, a Pioneer A27 uh, I powered it up I'd been working on it and I heard like a sizzling and I was thinking well man somebody's uh, making some bacon and that's gonna be good well it wasn't bacon it was the damn amplifier sizzling so anyway shut that off and it's never good having goop like that in your uh, amp and here's a Sony uh, amp that uh, blew a capacitor um, blew the artwork right off um, you know modern test equipment is great you know I've got some of it and I do test some capacitors with obviously you look at this capacitor and what might as well just say bad it's bad but you can't always go by that uh, here I show a schematic this is a schematic of a Pioneer SX 1050 receiver take a look at pin 6 near the top 76 volts and uh, pin 8 which is 24 volts and notice the capacitors off of those pins one's a 2200 25 volt off the 24 volt uh, pin and the other is a 470 uh, 80 volt off the 76 uh, volt pin that's pretty tight right but the pioneer in this case and all the other manufacturers they saved money you know you save pennies and you make tens of thousands of units you save you save a lot of money and, wh and why I bring this up is in this data from the manufacturers they talk about how you can reduce the maximum voltage reduce the temperatures to make these capacitors last longer uh, manufacturers gonna put in just enough you know and, and that's what they did but if you were working on this receiver which I was um, what I ended up doing is taking the 25 volt um, capacitor and upgrading it to a 50 
and I also took the um, 80 volt up to 100. Of course, the same microfarads, you know, 2200 and 470, but just a few pennies more. And again, these data sheets on these manufacturers' websites, if you want to know the difference, They'll say if you lower it 10 degrees Celsius, this is what happens to the reliability of that capacitor. If you run this capacitor 20% under voltage, it's rated, here's what you can expect. And the same thing, this shows some uh, filter capacitors. They had 71 volt filter capacitors, kind of a funny number, right? And it was responsible, it had 68 volts running off it. Is that fine? Yes. Um, and. You know, it, 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 again, they're looking at just getting enough so they can save money per, per unit. And, you know, in my case, I replaced it with an 80. You know, um, it's just a little bit better, gives you just a little bit more of a comfort level. Just to talk a little bit more about the capacitor parameters that you'll find at the man, on the manufacturer's websites. Um, here, you know, it shows a 22,000 microfarad, 100 volt uh, capacitor, a typical one that that you would use in a uh, vintage uh, stereo restoration. And this particular capacitor is rated at 85 degrees centigrade. Um, it's a with a 2,000 life, uh, 2,000 hour life expectancy. And you think to yourself, man. 2,000 hours, that doesn't sound that good, but first of all, 85 degrees Celsius is 185 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's that's pretty darn hot if your stuff's running at that temperature. But if you figure 2,000 hours and you divide 365 days into that, that's five and a half hours a day, and you're thinking to yourself, man, that's not very good. I run this thing in my office, you know? I mean, that's five and a half hours a day for a year, but if you lower it, to 75 degrees Celsius, which is still a frying 167 degrees Fahrenheit, you double the life expectancy of that of that capacitor. So, you know, these parameters, the, you've got to dig deeper to really take a look at, um, you know, what their life expectancies are. Because if you just take that raw number, 1,000 hours, 2,000, most of them go 1,000 up to 10,000. And many that I use are 2,000, 5,000, you know, in, in that range. Um, but if you look at all the parameters, all the manufacturers, basically what they're going to tell you is you're probably going to get 15 to 20 years out of these uh, capacitors and have them still meet their original specs. Okay, to wrap it up, um, you can probably see I'm kind of in the camp of uh, changing out those uh, old electrolytic capacitors. Um, it's hard to argue for, from my standpoint with the people who manufacturer of the product, who design the product, who test and validate the product. Um, all the information in today's world, it's great, it's all online. 40 years ago, 30 years ago, you wouldn't have been able to get this. Somebody would just told you, you know, something and you would just either agreed or disagreed. There was no way for you to, to really uh, do any research of your own. Um, in today's world, uh, all you got to do is go to Google and um, you can find out everything you ever wanted to know and a lot of stuff you probably didn't want to know about uh, the reliability and the longevity of uh, electrolytic capacitors. Now, I understand also, though, I'm in a unique situation. I am a collector uh, of the equipment. I love the equipment but I'm also a repairer and restorer of it. And um, a lot of you out there are not. Uh, you don't work on it. You may have an old receiver, an old amplifier. You may have several pieces. And um, the, the issue in today's world is really finding anybody to help you out with them. You know, that's, that's very difficult uh, in, in today's world um, to find somebody local around you that even if you say, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I need to get this thing looked at. It's, it's 40 years old. It's 50 years old. There's nobody to look at it. And so you start looking on the Internet and you see somebody halfway across the country who looks competent. Uh, and then you've got 
a hundred bucks probably in shipping to get it there a hundred bucks back including the packing because you got to pack these things like they're going to the moon and then you're still going to worry about it so you know you've got probably you know in, in the bigger pieces of equipment anyway a couple hundred bucks of shipping it there and back um, and anybody who's competent if you look out there they've got a lot of work because this stuff doesn't it, it you don't complete it quickly. You know, this isn't something somebody's going to look at. You send them your, you know, your 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 amplifier receiver, and it's going to take them quite a bit of time. And a lot of times they have quite a backlog. You know, there's it's nothing to have 60, 90, 120 day uh, waiting periods. So you've got a long waiting period. Then, you know, you've got the cost of parts. And, and let me talk about the cost of parts a little bit. Uh, just about any of the pieces of equipment even including the filter capacitors you won't have more than a couple hundred bucks in it and the filter capacitors and in, in the bigger pieces of equipment will be uh, the majority of the uh, cost um, the smaller capacitors and any transistors you want to change out they're really quite inexpensive the filter capacitors like for an example uh, in my uh, SX1980 Pioneer, they were about 25 bucks a piece. There's four of them, so there's a hundred bucks, and they're probably there wasn't there might have been another hundred bucks in, in the rest of the parts, and that was doing an end-to-end -end, uh, restoration. But a big thing you have is the labor cost. I mean, anybody that's competent. Um, it's going to cost you some money so you've got to decide if you want to do that too you know it's going to be several hundred dollars to to restore a, a piece of equipment so you know you've got a couple hundred in shipping let's say you've got a cup because if you're shipping it you're probably going to go right you're probably going to do the whole thing because why would you spend a couple hundred to ship it so you got a couple hundred in parts and then somebody's labor and you're you know probably knocking on a thousand dollars for for to have something restored and that's why a lot of people say the heck with it and I understand that I, I might say the heck with it too um, so a, a lot of my videos I do just to speak of that isn't isn't a a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, procedure for anyone. It's a lot of pictures, a little bit of talk um, to just help the average person maybe be able to work on their own equipment. Um, you know, some people can, some people can't. You know, if you can, great. Um, you know, or if you're an expert, that's why I, I hardly ever post online. I don't have any accounts on any of the big audio forums or anything because I really don't bring nothing to the table. You know, I, I, there's people who have forgotten more than I'll ever know on there. You know, they've got a half a dozen of those people and they don't need my help. And the other group is arguing if Marantz is better than Sansui. And, and that's not my thing either. So I'm, I'm trying to carry Carry on here with my videos uh, in a way that today and five years, ten years, twenty years down the road, somebody may look at them and say, you know, that's going to help me out. I think maybe, you know, I can I can repair this myself because, as I said, it's so difficult to find somebody local. It'd be great if you could put it in the car and just uh, drive up the road like you used to be able to. And then those days are rapidly coming to an end because people who used to work on this stuff um, are either retired or, um, you know, they're passing away and, and they just can't uh, and they're not doing it any longer for one reason or another. So, in, just to wrap up, as I said, if you can change out electrolytic capacitors, um, every manufacturer tells you you really should because they do have a limited life. Um, but bottom line, it is your equipment. And as I said, it's not so easy to necessarily have your equipment worked on. And if, if you don't think it's, it's worth doing, you, you just think, well, it works fine. It's always worked fine, and I'm not going to screw with it. That's okay, too, because it's your equipment. You can do with it as you please. Visit VintageAudioAddict.com for more repair and restoration tips on your vintage audio equipment.